Hello, everybody. We're back. It wouldn't be uh, Conor McGilligan and one Leeds if I wasn't muting myself as we started this. I st- this production, honestly. This production, I'm still getting mixed up. It's been a while, everybody, since a live stream. I honestly can't remember the last one I did with you guys where it was just me. Um, really, because I was buzzing. Like, you just get a feel for something. I was absolutely buzzing to do this this morning. Couldn't do it last night. As you guys know, I was covering the City game as well, so I could only do something... Really quickly last night when it came to Leeds, um, managed to catch the whole game, luckily. Um, well, unluckily, I should say. And we're going to get into the thick of it right now. I've got a few things I want to talk about. I want to talk about Patrick Bamford. I want to talk about Ipswich and Leicester and Leeds' position at the minute when it, com- it compares and our situation in comparison to those two sides and where I think they are ultimately stronger at the minute in, in many respects. And I want to talk about Daniel Farker, ultimately. And I want to really get your guys' thoughts on what's going on at the minute. Is he doing a good job? Is he not doing a good job? What needs to be improved? You know, and and football is reactionary. Of course it is. Like, I, I've never understood this thing that that you normally get from people who say, you know, it's just a reactionary take. Well, football is reactionary, unfortunately. And when Leeds are playing twice a week, you're going to have to react to the games that you're seeing, you know, and that's ultimately what we're here to do. Um, but before we do that, everybody, I would ask you to like the video. I would ask you to comment because we're going to try and get into all of your comments today and um, subscribe to the One Leads fan channel. And I'm back and I'm buzzing to be back, rejuvenated, revitalized and um, ready to talk about Leeds United in whatever capacity. So let me just get into a few of your comments. Uh, Justin, <clears throat> be a good day out at Wembley. I presume you are uh, referring to Leeds United, maybe not finishing in the top two, morning, Connor. Hey, Jay, uh, one of the top supporters of this channel and a Patreon member, guys. We are going to be uploading to the Patreon if you want to head on over there. Um, I'm still fuming after last night's overall performance overall. Those type of games we have to win. I agree, mate. Uh, getting into a few more of your comments. Dominic Martin says, so typical of Leeds, not been able to beat teams like Stoke. Reminds me of previous championship season, including Marcelo Bielsa's first season, a 2-1 loss to Stoke. A couple of good games then crash against teams like Wigan. Uh yeah, I'd agree. I'd completely agree with that. A lot of people talking about Nonso as well, which is interesting. Da- uh, Darren says, manager losses the game. Too many changes. Always play your strongest team. Win the game early, then make your substitutions simple. Good point, Darren. We're going to get onto that. Anyone uh, uh, in a little bit, I should say. Uh, James in the building, uh, really uh, so, um, good good support network for this channel. Appreciate this always, James. Um, hit that like button. Yeah, a lot of people asking, where's Daniel Farker talking about, you know, Patrick Bamford didn't really speak about him a lot. He didn't. Hey, Simon, uh, with the squad we have, says Jamie, um, our style of play should be better. I don't see a repetitive pattern of play. I'd, I'd completely agree with that, mate. I'd completely uh, agree with that. Pascal is the captain. He should have overruled Bamford and let Somerville take the pen. Well, <clears throat> let's get into it, shall we? Uh, okay, so... <clears throat> ultimately I want to start off with Patrick Bamford and I'm still in the same mindset as I was last night really uh just <clears throat> it's a constant feeling and you guys know if you've been subscribed to this channel for years and you have had this chat with LFC Lewis Joe Wayman Gabe all of all of the the YouTube lot who I'm in communication with Patrick Bamford I've I've never rated him ever and and uh, that I've been criticised for that, um, and I've been wrong. You know that first season in the Premier League, he was unbelievable, injury free, and I was like, "What is going on here?" Now the big thing for that for, for me, when you look at that and the 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 difference is crowds. That first season in the Premier League, the back end of that championship season, no crowds because of COVID. I think that actually has a massive impact on Patrick Bamford. Unfortunately, football is played under crowd, uh, you know, in front of crowds. You can't consistently have a COVID period where no fans are in the stadium. And I do think that had a massive effect on Patrick Bamford not having Leeds fans in and around the stadium or opposition fans in and around the stadium taunting him if he misses or or sighing if he doesn't control the ball. Albeit. I've never properly understood the hype with him. I'll be honest with you. The the hold up play, I think, is massively overrated. Um, 
his finishing has always been hideous. Apart from that one season where it was very, very good, the championship season, he, sh he literally should have had 35 goals with with Pablo Hernandez and those players behind him. Matthias Click, who was just imperious that season. And Leeds', his, Leeds his entire offensive outlet was so good and he only managed 16 goals. I thought he, he should have had more than that. I think I think Harrison got 11, did he, that season? Um, and then you roll into the latter part of his career, which has just been nothing short of abysmal. Injury-ridden, pretty much season out and massive, massive opportunities wasted for Leeds United. Um and I just, I, I really, I, I, I really don't understand the constant. I, I, I appreciate him as a servant to the club, and I've said this with Cooper and Ailing. I appreciate him as a servant to the club, but I'd have got rid of him two years ago, minimum. And I just don't understand why he still, you know, he almost seems like a, a key cog. He's one of the highest earners, if not the highest earner at the club at this moment in time. And I just thought last night that it was the epitome of you. Know, you've been at a club for such a long period of time. Side before self is the motto at Leeds United. You've got a young lad in Crescentia Somerville and even Rutter, who was there. And I know a lot of people are turning around and, and, and quite rightly saying, I've oh, Rutter missed against Salford, but you can miss a penalty. The difference between Rutter and Bamford is Rutter's not had a chance to, to score more penalties because, uh, you know, in comparison to Patrick Bamford, who has consistently missed penalties for Leeds United throughout his career and taken massive penalties off players and, and, and you know, taken huge moments into his hands. A lot of people can say that's courageous. I don't think it is. <clears throat> I think it comes when it's Patrick Bamford. I, I see it from a selfish perspective because of the, the cupping of the ears, you know, the, the sort of nonchalant, carefree attitude when he miss, when he misses a penalty. <clears throat> you know, five out of ten penalties missed. His last three missed. Um and it's just this approach to free kicks as, as you guys will know, you know, he he comes on the pitch and he wants every free kick. He wants he wants he wants every penalty we have. He seems to have this this ego about him where he needs to do this for him. But that's not what Leeds United is about. That's what not what Daniel Fark has built. And that's why I thought thought it was a little bit of an anon an an anomaly when it came to Marcelo Bielsa because it did feel a lot of it was built around Patrick Bamford. Um, <clears throat> and I just think right now it's got to that point with him where where it's it's just, it, I, 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 I cannot understand as a senior player in this division how he's taking the penalty I'm not just saying to Christ, saying to Somerville, who asked the captain, Pascal Strauch, if he could take it, you have it. You've got two goals in three. You've been excellent this season. If Somerville and Bamford are arguing over the penalty, why is a senior player not going to a younger player? You have it. Mine have been poor, but he doesn't. It's an ego stroke again. And once again, it is a beyond hideous penalty, which, which is a foot over the bar. It's a foot over the bar. And there's too many of these moments in recent history for Patrick Bamford. There's the Arsenal penalty miss. There's 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 massive chances which he's missed. There's the Newcastle penalty. There's the Leicester miss from two yards out. These are all just coming to the top of my head. There's last night. There's too many and people will be able to reel off more and more and more than I just have. But he keeps getting chance after chance after chance after chance to prove himself. And he's not he's not he's not giving us that validation. He's not giving any manager that validation for picking him. And that even went back to Sam Allardyce, as I say, at Newcastle, when we could have won the game there. <clears throat> These are big moments for a player who's on big wages and playing for a big club. And it's not good enough. It's simply not good enough. Um, and I'm seeing a lot at the minute of, ah, oh, I feel sorry for him. He's a lightning rod. As a senior player, you give that ball to Christ Hensio Somerville if he wants it. You've been at Leeds United for five years now. If he wants it, he's trying to come up in the world, you know, in, in, in the footballing world. He's trying to make a name for himself as you once did. And he's playing really, really well at the minute and is a massive reason why we are third in the table. Won us the game at the weekend. You give him that ball as a senior player. That's what I do. That's what I do. I put my ego to the side, but no, it turns into the Patrick Bamford show again. It's, I need to prove this. And it genuinely wouldn't have surprised me, for whatever reason, if he'd have scored and then cupped his ear to the Leeds fans. It wouldn't have surprised me. It really wouldn't. And that that is the problem. It feels like when he's on the pitch, it's him. It's all about him. And you're not good enough for it, mate. And when you take the ball away from 
And I think Pascal, it just shows the seniority in the camp as well, that Pascal has no sort of authority over him at those in those points. You know, Bamford could probably take a free kick in the last minute as well when, I don't know, you, you've maybe got an, another player on, on duty. It probably would have been Somerville on duty. Takes the ball off him. Strout's not going to say anything about him because he's not as senior as Bamford in that group. Cause Bamford's up there with Dallas, Cooper and Ailing. Um and he just does what he wants. And I just I just feel like it's it, that had to be stripped from him, from from Pascal Strout, but I think ultimately from the manager. And we're going to get onto that in just a little bit. But um let me just have a look at some of your comments. But as I said, the the whole the whole for me, the logic, and it's your it's, it's people's opinions. This fan base for Patrick Bamford has been the most giving fan base you will ever get. Guarantee I'll scroll up in the comment section below and you'll still see people. I've not had a look yet, but you'll still see people, some people backing him, which I just find staggering. I, I don't get it. At this point, I, I will be brutally honest with you and I respect your opinion, but it's laughable. It's, it's a laughable opinion at this moment in time. If you're still backing him, you're still wanting to see him. You're still wanting him to prove himself on penalties and free kicks. Are we a charity? Is that what we are now? Do we do, do we just like him because he was part of the Bielsa era? Is that what it was? He did well in the Premier League season under Bielsa. Is it a reflection of Bielsa? What the hell is it? I don't understand it. I really don't understand it. And yeah, I just I just found it massively frustrating last night. Obviously, Stoke go to the other end. Um, you know, he was he was almost near to there to Wesley as well. I know it was a Strauch own goal, but it's just a nonchalant. Oh, well, missed the penalty. Done it before. Um, let's have a look at a couple of your opinions. Hmm. Justin, here we go. But you can't blame Bamford. Uh, these 90 minutes sums up more than a football game. He missed the pen. What's happened to the other 88 minutes of the game? The thing is, Justin, if I said to you, the Leicester City game when it's 1-1 and Bamford has it at the back post to win us the game and get us three points. Are you bl Were you blaming the other 92 minutes there? When we could have gone, was it 3-1 and Patrick Bamford has a penalty to make it 3-1? Are you saying, oh, well, yeah, but look at the other the other minutes. Look at the other minutes. We, we should have scored. Well, we've, we've got an opportunity to score. You know, we've got an opportunity to score last night. Some really brilliant work from, from Georgina Rutter. We had an opportunity. That's what penalties are all about. Set pieces are all about. You curate an opportunity to score a goal. And that's what we did in that game. You, know, you look at the Newcastle, uh, the, the uh, Arsenal game. I think Leeds would have gone 1-0 up or we would have equalised. He misses the penalty. And because he's missed the, missed the penalty, we lose the game. So this is what strikers have paid the big money for. That's why they're blamed more than anyone else on the pitch. And I'd have been blaming Perot. Of course, last night, if you'd have missed the penalty, but with the amount of, of, of opportunities, massive opportunities, huge opportunities in his Leeds United career, he's missed, including game time, by the way. It's not acceptable. It's really not. And I'm, I'm really surprised that people are still backing the guy. And I agree, Justin. We're going to get on to the game state. We're going to get on to Daniel Farker. His squad, his, his shape, his, you know, the, the formation, the framework, everything. We're going to get onto that. But to not blame Patrick Bamford when he's missed a penalty to win us the game last night and keep us in contention with that top two, which is now drifting away, by the way, to keep us in contention, to get our fourth win on the bounce. We've got an opportunity to do that. They've gone the other end and scored. I, I just really struggle with that, mate. I really, really, I respect your opinion, but I struggle. Um, with you, with you on that one. Striker is there to score goals. Ultimately, it's just, it's been the same throughout history. Um, but yeah, it is what it is. Uh, uh, Ryan says I've given chances in defending, but I was screaming at the TV last night when he grabbed the ball. Enough is enough. Now, and that's the thing as well. That's the thing as well, Ryan. It's it's every, it's not it's not it just uh, um uh. Justin will have been doing the same. He'll have been doing the exact same. You know, you've had Sujal, you'd have had Steve, you'll have had Lucas, Jay, Nige. You'd have had all of you doing the exact same thing last night. You're standing there thinking, what is he doing on the ball? No, get him off it. Get him off it. But no seniority. And that comes also from the manager. Now, I want to touch a little bit on Ipswich and Leicester. It's going to be tough, everyone, this now. It's going to be really tough. And this is me being realistic. Um, I, I, I had the Ipswich in my top two at the start of the season. Didn't have Leicester there. Um, 
Ipswich are a very, very, very well coached side. An extremely well coached side. If you watch them at all, and I would honestly, I would honestly, when, when Leeds aren't playing guys, switch over to Ipswich and watch them play football. If Leeds were playing that sort of football, you'd be very, very, very happy. A very good press, functional. They all know each other's roles. And by the way, even when they've got players coming off the bench, you know, Hutchinson, um, uh, they had, I think, I think is it, uh, the um, Ladapo coming off the bench uh, the other night, I believe it was. Even when players are out, you know, players are a little bit injured. I believe Wes Burns is out for a couple of weeks, who's one of their mainstays. I think he was, but but there has been rotation in that Ipswich lineup. People keep saying they're going to fall off, they're going to get injuries. Everyone is drilled in that system, in possession and out of possession. They are extremely, extremely effective and very, very difficult to play against. We got the win over them. Of course we did. Of course we did. But, um, you know, I believe it was Liverpool beat Man City in the 18-19 season, then got a draw against them and City still won the league. You know, it doesn't really matter. You've got to be consistent through the entire season. And that is one thing that Ipswich have. It's consistency. These They are flying at the minute. Leicester are flying. Now, I said yesterday, I'm not that impressed by Leicester. I'm not. I'm, I'm genuinely not. I think Mavdidi aside, they're not. Um, they're not a team where I look at and think, "Oh yeah, they're 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 really really good." I genuinely believe we can go there and do something. Leicester, concentrations, I focus on, and ultimately Farker gets it right. But they have individuals across the pitch, not just not just up top, but across the pitch. You know, Vestergaard, James Justin at phase. You know, Ricardo Pereira in net. You know, these sorts of players, even defensively, are a Premier League class. So they've got individuals. It's not all about the system. I think Enzo Maresca is is doing a, a decent job, but I think the players, the talent that they've got is getting him out of a lot. They're winning loads of games after the 80th minute. You know, Sunderland were massively in it the other night and should have had a penalty, but they're winning games because of the quality that they have. Ipswich don't have the same quality, but as we know, being... Bielsa disciples, as Leeds United fans, we know the system is everything. That first season under Marcelo Bielsa, that side was so average. We all know it was so average. But Bielsa not only got their fitness levels to a thousand out of a thousand, but also got them into a drilled system where teams could not deal with us. I remember going to Villa away um, when we beat them 3-2, the comeback. And throughout the entire game, Leeds were just playing the exact same way, but were so drilled in and out of possession. And it was funny as well because Villa's individual quality went that put them 2 0 up, but Leeds just, the system overrided um, Villa's individual quality. And I think it does a lot of the time. You know, I know when you get to Man City levels, it's very different, but I think especially at this level, the system is imperative. Everybody knowing their role, everybody knowing when to press, when not to press. When to cover, when not to cover. And Ipswich at the minute have that. And there's a reason I'm, I'm bringing Ipswich up and not touch on Leicester as much. They have the individual quality. Ipswich don't, but the system is absolutely imperative. And they're just getting the job done every week. It's efficient. It's almost German-like. And I understand people saying they're going to drop off. They might drop off, but I'm not seeing it at the minute. I'm not seeing any point where they are dropping off. You know, away from home, they're barely conceding. At home, they're scoring a fair bit of goals. And they've still got tough games to come. Of course they have. But I think it's going to be really tough at the minute to knock them off their perch. And we're very unlucky at the minute because these two are the, are the best starters in championship history. Um, but normally that's an indication of something. <clears throat> Uh, Lee says, all Bam Bamford wanted to do is cup his ear. Yeah, mate. Uh, cheers for your donation as well, pal. Cheers for your donation. Um, they'll drop off when promotion is sealed. Yeah, I, I guess so, but I don't really know how that's relevant. But yeah, <laughs> I don't see a clear style of play uh, at Leeds. Sometimes we press. Sometimes we half press. Sometimes we rely on individual brilliance and ultimately not enough goals in the side. Haston Brew, really, really good comment there, Jamie. Um, you know, we, uh, we always sort of... Um, align I think with our thoughts as well as I do with all the, the one Leeds fan base but the reason I mention this is it's I think a lot of it's the consistency the common problem we're seeing with Leeds at the minute is obviously the ruthlessness you know beating QPR 1-0 I mean it's a win everyone but QPR are abysmal we're really bad at that moment in time as well beating a you know not been able to 
put away one of the worst teams in Sheffield Wednesday I've seen, Ellen Road, um, you know, Bristol City. We, you know, these There are games in there that we're winning, but we're not doing it with conviction. We're not doing it. And those patterns are, are filtering into other games. You know, last night, not been able to score. Um, Norwich with the abundance of chances we had in that first half, which was it was actually actually startling. Not having that composure in front of goal to effectively dispatch of a team in Norwich. So I want to talk about Daniel Farker as well. So what I will say is, <clears throat> I think my big caveat for Daniel Farker is the crap that he had to deal with at the start of the season and come through was completely unique. You know, what's 10, 11 players wanting to leave um, going out on loan, having all these clauses in his contract, in their contracts, and it being a really slow start for Leeds. West Brom, Cardiff, Sheffield Wednesday thrown in there. So I'll give him that. I think he's really, really struggled when it's come to, and, and I think a lot of fans have, have struggled when it's come to the situation at Leeds and the absolute SHIT show we've faced. At the minute, Leeds aren't overachieving whatsoever. With the talent that we have in this squad, I don't think defensively we're great. I still don't. I think it's I think it's Joe Rodon plus the others. But I always used to think that with Ben White. I thought it was Ben White plus the others in that Bielsa side. Um, and I think it's similar, very, very similar now, even though I think Strauch's doing well. I think Rodon is still that you know the next level up as Ben White was. So that's similar to those Bielsa days, but... I think we've got better attacking quality, miles better attacking quality than what we had in 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 those Bielsa days. I, I really do, you know, Pablo Hernandez aside. But what I'm seeing with Leeds is Rutter as the m- most forward man trying to ignite some sort of weird press. And I'm seeing Perot in the midfield. And he's spoken before about Joel Perot not being that type of presser. That confused me a little bit because coach him then, make him that type of presser. I understand he might not have the attributes in terms of his speed, but he can still press. He can still move up the field three or four yards when the centre-back has the ball. He can do that. He's not that type of presser when he went on his long rant um, about strikers. It was very confusing to me. I remember speaking to a couple of my mates about it. Well, why isn't he that sort of... We'll, we'll coach him into being that sort of presser because we've had a coach before two, three years ago, who coached the life out of these players into doing things that they've never done before, including a press. Do you think Patrick Bamford was a presser beforehand? No. Was Luke Ayling? No. Was Pablo Hernandez? No. But he still featured because he coached him into being part of a pressy system. So what what we're seeing at this moment in time is Rutter being that guy who presses but the midfield doesn't come with him. Then we're seen as being outnumbered in midfield in multiple games because Joel Perot is part of the midfield as a number 10. And Joel Perot can't really run, doesn't seem to be functional in, in any respect, respect in midfield. Joel Perot is in the side to get the ball, shoot and score. But he's been played in part of a midfield um, set consistently and last night you saw us just get completely num- outnumbered in that department and they were finding pockets in the midfield that were doing the exact same in the in the in the Nor- in the Norwich game um when Sarah and McLean were, were able to find their front men it was really easy for them to do so pro is dropping and it's not working so I don't understand Rutter as well he's so so good um at this level and I think he is in general he's such a talent that just literally, methodically putting him in that number 10 role. I think you get even more from him. I really do. But I just don't understand this, this notion that Farker touches on of, oh, well, well, well Perot's, Joel's not that type of player. Well, coach him. Coach him into that being that style of player. Um, I think last night was a, was a, I praise him, as I've said, for being proactive against Norwich. But last night, the delaying substitutions were, were startling to me. I didn't get it. Um, really didn't get it. 
And then you look at the one player who we all know when we've watched him, Kamara, next to Ampadu, gets the ball and, and really is able to bypass a press when he's being pressed or he's just so silky. I keep calling him a silky smooth operator, but that's because he is. I, I, you rarely see him losing the ball. He's very composed under pressure. And we knew Stoke last night were going to come and press. They play wide, they press, they try to get the ball in the box as much as possible. That has been their whole blueprint this season. They'll press high under Neil, filter the ball out wide and whip it in. And the amount of turnovers in our half last, na last night was staggering. And that just continued. So there's no, there was no adaptation. And that's, that's, that's a general theme with Daniel Farker. I think sometimes the adaptation is just the subs, the three subs who we all expect. But last night, he brought them all on in the 70th minute, you know, 20 minutes left when that should have been made at half time. So we're absolutely dreadful. Why are the subs not being made at half time? So sometimes you're praising for being proactive, but then he's not reactive enough. So it's, it's, it's neither here nor there. And I think that, that ultimately is consistency. And that is feeding into the entire side, really, at the minute. The consistency just isn't there. Whereas when you look at Leicester, when you look at an Ipswich, it's consistent. So, and that, you know, a lot, there's, 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 there's a lot of examples of, of where, you know, Southampton, we weren't great. QPR second half was dreadful. Norwich, I feel that maybe could have gone either way. And obviously last night at Stoke. Um, but yeah, I'm just reading off a few notes here, guys, that I've made. Just a few, a few notes that I made last night. Now, I know a lot of people are talking about the individuals, you know, like Leicester. Leicester having these individuals. But we've also got individuals and we should be winning games. And I think we are ultimately winning games on individual talent. But should he be getting more out of our front line? I, I think he should. I think he should. And I think in recent games, he struggled a little bit to figure it out. And I know we've been winning. I, I understand we've been winning, but we've been under the cosh in large phases of these games. You know, you look at even the tactical decision against his old winger, on El Hernandez, who on his days is, is, is fabulous at this level, puts Archie Gray there again up against him. And Archie's just getting murdered in that first half. You know, I thought last night it would have been a good decision. I didn't realise Vidigal was going to play. Vidigal played on that side and Archie struggled for a large portion of it. And then Byram obviously was struggling on the other side. There doesn't seem to be any adaptation there. It's just keep going. And, and what we'll do in the second half is we'll just try win it with the front three, the three subs up front. And then and then if we do score, we'll bring we'll bring Ailing on in the 93rd minute. It just seems a little bit scripted when it comes to the substitutions. And, and yes, it's difficult to defend against that because of the quality that we've got. But it just seems systematically that he's getting a few bits wrong at the minute. Um, and, it, and I've mentioned Archie Gray there. He's got, to, he's got to start resting him. He's got to start resting him. He's killing him at the minute. It's Archie looks tired. We mentioned this at the start of the season. He can't keep playing him and he's playing him every single week. It's almost he's like his little, his little um, Aaron's, you know, Aaron's at Norwich when he when he brought him through. It's like his, his little experiment to say, look what I've done. And it's not, listen, it's not all negative at the minute. It's not. And I'm, I'm just putting the question out there and I want to get your guys' thoughts. Um, I'm not, I'm not bashing Daniel Farker. I'm not, but, I am thinking he's getting a, a few bits wrong at the minute. I, I I personally do. You know, it's a little you know, a little bit of criticism, of course, but I think he's just getting a few bits wrong. The, the, the I think last night the centre backs are getting the ball. <laughs> Where's the press? You saw Rutter a couple of times pressing on his feet, not out of instruction, pressing on his toes, I should say, not out of instruction, but just out of playing, I can get the ball here. And he tackles their centre-back who looked dodgy on the ball. And then we just didn't do it again. We just, every, every time their centre-backs had the ball, we just fall back and they'd pass it out wide. And then they'd just do a quick movement in central midfield or to their centre-forward. And that'd be it. You know, they'd be in our half so easily. There's no press. There's no functional press at all. There's a little, there was a little bit against Norwich, but there was none last night. There was a tiny bit against Bristol City, but there was none against QPR. There was a little bit against West Brom, but there was zero against Sheffield Wednesday. There's no functional press. And I'm a little bit worried about that. A little bit worried about that. And when we've been pressed on ourselves, Southampton presses into oblivion. We really, really struggled even though Daniel Farkin knew what Southampton were going to do. There was no effective system against that. You know, we weren't playing the ball long 
and getting our our wingers in and behind that press because we weren't able to play through it. And last night we weren't able to play through it for for large for about sixty minutes. We couldn't play through it, and the turnover in our half, like Southampton, was consistent. So the problem with that is teams are going to get a blueprint of what to do against Leeds and commit to a press because Leeds struggled to play through it. So a lot to a lot to consider there. I think a lot to consider, and you know, it's not as I say, I'm not being ultra. Well, you're critical. This is the first time I've ever come on here uh, when we've had Farker in charge and really looked scrupulously at some of the things he's doing um, and questioned them. And I am questioning them at the minute. And I think it's all well and good. As Justin has said earlier on, and he does he does do this. He do, I've noticed he does this. He, he, he'll never really take accountability a lot of the time, and I've been told this by a few people about his system and maybe certain personnel being in certain positions, he will just say, you know, if this had happened, we'd have won the game. And he's right. If Listen, Bamford scores, we win the game. But you've changed two wingers who have been, let's be honest, have won us the game against Norwich. You've, you've completely changed those two wingers with with no... You mentioned some has got a slight knock, but, you know, um, when he came on, he was he was flying, wasn't he, when he, when he first came on? Kamara apparently needed a rest. Okay, fine. But why not do that against Huddersfield? Why not do that against Huddersfield at home where the pressure is going to be less intense? Away at Stoke feels like a very, very intense game to make three massive changes. Your two wingers who've been hugely important to Leeds this season and then to give Gruev his full debut full debut against what you know is going to be a very intense Stoke team who are going to press us. And overall, on the balance of play, you can't really deny that they deserved it last night. You know, second half were probably a little bit better. But that first half, they should have gone two or three in. You know, they should have done. And I just, there's a few things to, to I think like I've just, I've just mentioned, you know, you go back and, and I don't know if I quite finished my point there before I got distracted. But if, if he's saying this moment wins us the game or this moment wins us, and he, he do, as I've mentioned, he does do that a lot. Oh, well, if this had happened, we'd have won the game, but that's football. We've not been ruthless enough and he's right. But a lot of his decisions need to, you know, aid that. And I think some it's just so inconsistent. And I think systematically, there's a little bit of a problem. I think without a press or, or an inconsistent press, uh, uh, you know, I press every now and again, it's going to kill us this season. I think it's just going to be problems. And I think it's going to see us in the playoffs because it's not going to breed consistency and we're going to lose, we're going to lose, you know, more games than we actually think against some of these lower league teams. Um, <clears throat> terrible first uh, half, Farker's fault. Love Farker, but he needs to keep a winning side then make changes when we're 2-3 up. Lucas says, Defence can never be good enough if, if we keep relying on a 17-year-old playing out of position a right-footed left-back. Spence is so key. Um, you can see him making a difference and maybe even further. But I agree. Yeah, I think, Lucas, you, you're not far off there, mate. You're not far off. Um, the the Byram thing is, I mean, that's why, I mean, Byram struggled against Southampton on that left-hand side. And I've always said it with him, you know, if he's if he's pressed on his left foot, if he's pressed on his left foot, you saw it last night, he takes four or five touches because he's not confident on his left foot. And he knows someone's coming towards him. He needs to overcompensate. He needs to feel comfortable on that left foot. There was a couple of times where Rutter got him out of situations last night, you know, using his body and being a defensive, you know, um, specimen. You know, getting his body and moving the ball forward. A couple of times, Bam, uh, Byron pat, pat, patted him on the back against Southampton and Stoke, two teams that are pressing, and even Ipswich in that second half. Byron was really, really poor. I thought. It's all right when players have got time on the ball, but then Farker needs to figure out a way of when we are pressed, how to get past that. Do we go long? If we can't play through them, do we go long and work that way? Uh, Seamus says, it was so obvious from the start that it was the wrong lineup. There's no sin or loss of face in changing it when it's when it's needed, not waiting until the last 20 minutes. Welcome back, Connor. Thanks, Seamus. Yeah, I agree, mate. I completely agree. Well, I was calling for it. I think everyone was calling for it at um, half time, but it was almost like a... The stubbornness and, and and Anthony came into it in the second half. I thought it was a lot better in the second half, uh, but ultimately it wasn't a good performance from it. it wasn't a good performance from Nonto. 
And you saw a little bit of threat when James came on straight away and obviously quite since some of them had a shot straight away and should have had the penalty. Um, but yeah, the, the threat from some of it is completely different to what, um, you know, Nonto offers. It's completely different. Uh, <clears throat> subscribe, folks. Connor is so close to 30k subscribers. Yeah, it'd be great, everybody. I don't ask for it a lot, but if you could just subscribe and like the video, that'd be fantastic. Uh, Zilly Zossage uh, says, it's, tr it's tricky. Fark gets a winning side against Southampton. We got mullered. Stoke was the wrong game for wholesale changes, though. Yeah, I, I think the big one against... I think we'd have all been happy against Southampton if he'd have put Rowan on back in. And I, d I do not understand why he did, he, he did that. He kept Cooper in. Cooper got murdered. And we all see every single game that when Rodon's in, we look, we look so much more solid. And he's literally one of the best players on the pitch. He was excellent again last night. And another one who was so pissed off at Bamford, he probably wanted to go in and just punch him in the face. Rodon showed more care in that moment than Bamford did when he missed the penalty. What does that tell you? Um, but yeah, he did keep a winning side. Uh, uh, but, you know, Rodon, you've got to put him in. We all know that. But he just, a lot of, a lot of you know, giving someone his debut, when he's said, what, a week ago, he's not up to match fitness and just changing the wingers who won you the game at the weekend was bizarre, was bizarre. Uh, Metro C says, nice to see people waking up to the new Messiah's limitations. We'll not get promoted with Daniel. No change, not my fault. Farquhar and Chad. It is very like that. <clears throat> and I've been told that. <laughs> I've been told that. Trust me, before we got him, I've been told that, that he's he's... Yeah, not my fault. It's very much not my fault. So a lot of it was his fault last night. We can blame Bamford, of course we can. And like Justin said, it's not all up to Patrick Bamford. A lot of it needs to be on Farker's shoulders. And um, maybe last night he should have come out and said, look, I got it wrong. And he didn't. Um, but guys, I'm going to leave it there. Listen, nearly 500 of you in the building. If you want to go back and watch this, you can do on the replay. I would really appreciate a like on the video. would really appreciate you subscribing to the channel. Keep everything locked in on our socials, which is One Leads FC everywhere. If you want to join the Patreon, we are going to be uploading back on the Patreon. Connor is back. We're going to be doing a few specific analysis bits on there. If you want some bonus content, link will be in the description below. As I say, guys, I really, uh, really appreciate. Um, and just a quick one here. Let's blame the manager, eh? Um, no, we can talk about the manager. This is what we do. Uh, we come on these channels and and, and talk about the problems. And he, he, he made a few problems last night. Disagree? Let us know why you disagree. Uh, guys, been an absolute pleasure. See you in a bit. Cheers. Okay.